Today is World Obesity Day. Later on, we will be discussing why obese patients are being denied Ozempic. But first, we want to look at the surgical options for these patients. We know that at least 10 Irish citizens have died following medical and cosmetic procedures abroad in the last three years. So why are so many Irish people willing to risk their health and their lives to go abroad for cut price weight loss surgery? And I want to go to Leanne now. Leanne, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Katie. Leanne, you went to Turkey. I did indeed. In 2021, October 2021. Yes. So why did you make that decision to go? I made the decision to go because of price, mainly because it was a lot cheaper to get it done in Turkey than it was in Ireland. When I priced Ireland, it was like 12 to 14,000 at the time. I couldn't afford that. And, and had you been advised by a doctor to get that you, you should be? No, no. I've seen people who've had the surgery done and I said, they're looking great. I'd love it done. Hated my weight, hated how I looked. Can I ask you what weight were you at the time you made that decision? At the time I made the decision, I was 16 stone 10. And before, beforehand, I was nearly 19 stone, which I did go to Slimming World. Then lockdown happened and that blew. I had lost weight with Slimming World and that just blew it out of proportion because I'd put up the weight and more. OK, so you hadn't seen a doctor hear about it. When you got in contact with this clinic that you were going to go to, yes. did they do checks with you to establish if you were, like I know you went with your daughter or with two other friends. Yeah. What checks did they do to establish that you were good candidates? They asked me my age, my weight and my height. That was it. They agreed to go ahead with the surgery yes. on the basis of that information? Yes. And you got a deal because there was four of you? Yes. Was there not alarm bells going off in your head at this point? There was and there wasn't because they were so, <coughs> the way they speak to you and text you back, it was through text message and WhatsApp is how I got in contact with this hospital. And the way they talk to you, like they reassure you about this, you have so much, like we've dietitian there for you, we have the doctors, we'll have everything so mindful. So we, we discussed it, the four of us, and we said, OK, look, we'll go ahead. Because we, as I said, that I had known people who have gone over and getting this operation done. So we just said, look, we'll go ahead with it. OK, so as I say, you all went out there. Yeah. The other three, your daughter and your two friends, they all got on OK. Their operations went well. Thank God. Your operation God, was yeah. kicked into the next day. Yes. And you immediately, even as you came around from, from the surgery, you were vomiting blood, you felt yes. something was not right. Yes, I was vomiting blood for about two days and I just didn't feel well. They were saying, oh, that's normal, that can happen because they remove 80% of your stomach. So they said blood can enter into the stomach so it can happen. So I believe them because they're professionals. So I just took their word for it. So you flew home, you did manage to get on a plane and get home. Yes. You weren't feeling well at home. No. And then you, you collapsed. On the Tuesday morning, on the, I flew home on the Saturday. I got home Saturday evening. And on the Tuesday morning, um, I didn't feel well at all. I said I'd go in to have a shower. And when I actually woke up, in my, after standing up, I woke up in my bed. And then I just knew something wasn't OK because I went to stand up again and I'd collapsed again. So um, at that stage then, my partner was actually out in the shed because he'd asked me, did I need anything? And I was like, no, so I'd rang my sister. So you did, and your partner came then, and then there was a, an ambulance was called. Yes. And you were rushed to hospital. Yes. <coughs> you were in very bad shape when you got to hospital. I was straight into resource, and my family were called to say goodbye to me. Yeah. Even saying that now, I yeah. mean, uh, <laughs> Looking back, I mean, you, you came through it? Yes, yes. Lucky enough, I came through it. Um, when I got to, when I went into the hospital straight to resus, my blood levels, as far as my blood pressure went down to 48 over 27. Um, my blood sugar levels went to 16. I was not diabetic, never had been. I wasn't even borderline diabetic. Um, they said that I had a very bad infection, but when they brought me to the they done an immediate CAT scan on me and said that my spleen was bleeding. 
So during my bariatric surgery, the gastric sleeve did nick my spleen, but hadn't informed me. So that was where the blood was, that was, that was what was causing that's what your problem was, and that's yeah. where the infection set in. So I got sepsis and went into septic shock. Yeah. So you are very lucky to be with us tonight. Yes. Very lucky to be with us at all. Yes. Looking back now, what would you, what would you advise others in your situation? Looking back at it, I saved 10,000 by going to Turkey. I would advise people, if it takes two, three years, save the money to get it done here in Ireland. That 10,000 could have been used that I saved for my funeral because it was looking that way. I was literally given 30 minutes to live. And they, I have to thank the UHL in Limerick. They were amazing. Only for them, I wouldn't be here today. And like to other people out there, please do not go to Turkey. Save your money, have the operation here. If Ireland even reduced the price, it's the price that's killing people as well. People can't afford that. People are, can't even afford to live at the minute with the price of the increase of everything. But even if they reduce the price of surgery here to save to get it done here in Ireland, because I'm lucky to be here. My kids could have been left without their mum because of my choice. I felt that I got very depressed after it. I had to have counselling because I kept thinking that I was leaving my family behind for something that I was I was actually feeling disgusted with myself because I'd made that decision to go there. Well, we're very glad that you are with us tonight, thank Leanne, you. and we really thank you for coming in and telling thank your you story. Thank you for having me, Katie. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I want to go to Alison there beside you now. Alison, you also went to Turkey. Uh, uh, you were diagnosed at the time as clinically obese. Like yeah. I'm looking at you now. <laughs> it's hard to believe. Yeah. Uh, you were, you had a BMI of 30. 43. Oh, sorry, a yeah. 40, a 42, because uh, 30 is the cutoff. But yeah, uh, once you go over 30, it's, uh, it's clinically obese and then morbidly obese. Uh, so what, uh, when you were at that stage in your life, how was that affecting you health-wise? Physically, um, I was just, I was exhausted. I was just exhausted from everything. Um, very fatigued, um, I suppose, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. Um, and it was just in my mind for a long time that this was always going to be a last resort for me. And obviously hearing your story is everyone's worst nightmare. That's everyone's worst nightmare coming out of Turkey and obviously you were very lucky to be here. Um, there is some shocking stories out there and I'm very grateful to be here. Um, but I was aware when I was going of the risks as well, you know, I was very, but I was very desperate. Very Did desperate. you try and get the treatment here? So I would have had a lot of people in my life that have had surgery in Ireland and it's the, the hoop jumping to get there, the timing of it, the cost of it. And that is what made me go to Turkey. So I had discussed it with my GP here when in Ireland. When you say the time, you mean the, the wait, the waiting time? Yeah, list. the waiting time. I felt like, how long more can I put my life on hold? I was just shy of 29 when I went to Turkey. I was 32 weeks ago. And like, for me, I've been on a diet since I'm eight. Like, something had to give. I needed to do something about it. If Basically, it since you were eight years of age. Yeah, I mean, I tried to get a communion dress in Cork City when I was eight. I remember traips around the shops with my mum. And it was not like, oh, what do you want to wear? It's like going into the shop and subtly asking the lady, what's going to fit her, you know? And my mom was doing the best she could. You know, my parents are amazing, very supportive. And even when I told them I was going, they were like, okay, we support you. We always knew you were going to get the surgery. We just didn't know when. So for me, it was, I knew the risks going over there and I had done my research. I had actually originally booked with a different clinic and I booked and I paid my deposit and the red flags just started pinging and I was just like, there's no way I can, I was going with my gut. I always follow my gut. It's never steered me wrong. And I was in a group chat with a couple of girls that had gone over a couple of weeks before me to this particular hospital in Turkey. And the surgeon was doing about 10 to 12 surgeries a day, bariatric surgery, gastric sleeves. And that was shocking alone anyway when I heard that. But you when, really don't want to be number 10 or 11 on that no, list, do you? but you also don't want to be 16, 17 or 18 because that surgeon's son was sick and the girl was told that you can pick a different surgeon if you want and we can do it today. 
or you can wait for him tomorrow so, and we can rejig it around. So there was no rejigging. The six other pa or there were six patients on his list that slotted in that day as well. So he ended up doing between 16 and 18 surgeries the following day. Okay, so you were not going to be in that clinic? Absolutely not. So you found another clinic that yeah. you were very happy with? Yeah, found another clinic, yeah. And you were very happy with it? You were very impressed with very the care impressed. you got? Yeah, it actually, to be honest with you, like it exceeded my expectations. Um, you hear the stories, like obviously in Turkey, and like it's, it's not great news coming out of there a lot of the time. You obviously hear a lot more of the, neg the negatives than the positives, but you do have to see the full picture of it. There's no point going over there, looking at Instagram and seeing a before and after picture. That's fantastic, like, but you don't know the journey that happened in between that either. But even though you did your thing, you got a translator and everything, so you weren't signing documents you, that you, you, you couldn't read, you, you did all your research, you had yeah. very good care, you were very happy. Yeah. You were still, you'd still say there is a big issue around aftercare when you go away for the surgery. Yeah, 100%. Like, I mean, as much as I appreciated the work of the team in Turkey that looked after me. Like, honestly, they went above and beyond. I actually was in Turkey alone as well. I chose to travel over there on my own. But like, they were so supportive and like, they kept in contact with my partner, like making, like literally bringing him step by step. So by the time he got to the, the door at work, my surgery was over and done with. He knew that I was safe, you know? Um, but yeah, it's, I don't know, it's, it's one of those things where, but then when I was leaving, it's like, here's your bag of medication and here's your bag of your, your, your protein shakes. And there you go, on the plane you go, here's all your forms. And you get on the plane, you get home, you are on your own. You are on your own. And I will say, I am very lucky that I have access to my dietitian over in Turkey. I can pick up the phone and ring her or message her day or night. There's no problem, she'll come back to me. But the same with my surgeon as well. I had a slight issue when I came home. I was actually, um, I think it was about two weeks post-op and I was starting my puree stage and I ended up being sick, but I was vomiting blood. So obviously the alarm bells were going. Of course. I was panicking and I was like, what do I do here? And I just thought, I'll just text him and just see, you know, maybe he'll answer me. And it was about 11 o'clock over in Turkey and he, answered, he texted me back straight away. He's he your said, surgeon? My surgeon. And he said, okay, so what, what did we do? What did we have? I explained what I had via WhatsApp message. And, you know, I just said to him that like, you know, I, well, he said to me, did you eat a little bit quicker? Or was it a little bit warm? And I was like, yeah. He said, once is okay, but if that happens again, you need to bring yourself to A&E. Okay, so again, you, you, you obviously made some very good choices in terms of where you were, yeah. but you still think people should be able to access this in Ireland. Yeah, if someone said to me, like I paid 3,000 euro for my, for my surgery, excluding the flights, like, you know, like I see online all this, you know, the PR and the marketing around bariatric surgery in Turkey is just, it's just disgraceful to be honest. Like it's, it's very like in your face and like if you don't pay this, the deposit by this time, it's gonna go up 500 euros. So they do, they properly kind of get you to, to kind of lock Commit. you in straight away. They really do. But I would honestly say like if someone, so I paid 3000 euro, if someone said to me, okay, Alison, here's the deal. You can wait a year and you can get it done in Ireland. And you know, we'll, it's going to cost you 6,000 euro or you know, we're going to de deduct you at source or something like that through my wages to pay a little bit more. I would have waited. Yeah.